Uh, Konsan Miranda also contributed. But Alex Yeung also contributed a uh, chapter. And I don't see Colleen Gallagher, he, she's here with us, but uh, she also contributed uh, a chapter and also all the other ones uh, on the panel. So the idea um, of this um, book presentation is to just uh, flush out some of these uh, questions that we discussed in the, in the, in the workshop um, in a way that is much more dynamic. I, I don't think I want to ask every one of us to say like five, 10 minutes about what they wrote. That would be a little bit too long and we don't have much time. So um, the methodology that um, I thought would be easiest would be to kind of give them some leading questions and maybe they could talk about uh, what they think and then I would just intervene as we go along. Um, so the first uh, type of question would be directed to Alberto Garcia, uh, the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair in Biotech and Human Rights and one of the co-editors of this book. Um, so Alberto, what is the, um, the reason that we have human rights? Where does this necessity come from? Um, you can give us some like a brief historical yeah, basically, basically the idea of human rights has the origin in the reflection about what, what we are as human beings uh, and the identification of some basic needs or some fundamental uh, necessities we have to develop our life in, in, the, in the society basically when we get a list of the human rights, for example, in the Universal Declaration uh, on Human Rights, you have the right to life, the right to freedom, the right to integrity, the right to family, to get a job, all these kind of things are special <coughs> needs. And that means, as we have also listened in the video, that it should be recognized these fundamental needs of human beings should be guaranteed by the people and also by the authorities mm -hmm. and also to promote conditions in which our life can flourish, mm -hmm. our freedom can be expressed, mm -hmm. and we can so, create a family. When you say this is universal, it means that it is, uh, these rights are present in everyone uh, regardless of who they are, where they come from, mm -hmm. their cultural background, yeah, in that sense, right? In that sense, and this is something that I think is transcultural. So, the, mm -hmm. so freedom or life or integrity is not something that we receive from mm -hmm. the law, from the state. Mm -hmm. This is something that exists in nature. Okay. And somehow in some traditions we link mm -hmm. human rights with also what we call the natural law. Mm -hmm. That sense. But the different traditions can explain how they identify this, mm -hmm. that are fundamental needs mm -hmm. or fundamental goods, mm -hmm. and how we should respect and guarantee, and especially we in the, in the modern time, human rights have been recognized also politically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, of, one of the things that um, it came out in our discussion uh, was that. Um, some people are saying uh, that human rights is a Western concept. It came out from Europe, from America, but it is predominantly a Western concept mm -hmm. and it might not be applicable or universal uh, to everyone. What do you say about that? And also later on I'll ask, especially those from the, uh, from the East who seems to have this complaint, mm -hmm. what do you say about that? Is it universal in a strict yeah. sense? Or? The, cate the category and the concept of human rights is from the Western mm -hmm. culture. Right. But the fundamental needs are universal. Mm -hmm. The fundamental goods are universal. Mm -hmm. And so, politically speaking, these fundamental goods have been recognized by the political authorities first in the Western countries. Right. Philosophy, uh, philosophers and theologians, especially from the Christian tradition, mm -hmm. and I think also from the Jewish tradition, I'm not sure about it, they have been talking about these fundamental needs even before the Illuminism. 
<laughs> before, like in life, 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 life. So the human rights are not an invention of the French Revolution. Okay. It's not an invention. Let, let's hear rights. about it from the West, from the East, from Confucianism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. Do you think um, these rights are universal in the sense that um, they are true uh, for every culture? And it's not a Western imposition, or some people will even say that it's a colonial mentality that is imposed in the West. Let's uh, hear from Buddhism, from Alan. What do you say about that? Not, not this, this. It, it, I think it should be noted that the language of rights is not part of Buddhist tradition. Um, that being said, doesn't mean that um, Buddhism absolutely uh, have you know, uh, rejects the notion of right, I mean, human rights and to a certain degree. And in my paper, actually, I divided rights in terms of negative rights and positive rights. I think that Buddhism have no trouble to accept what they call Okay, so you don't think it's, it is, uh, you can accept it as being universal and not a Western idea? Okay. Right, even though the language, I mean, the, the language is, language, but right. there's some kind of the concept could be found yeah, yeah. to be conceptualized right. and to, you know, in a way to match right. the idea of right. How about Confucianism? I know that uh, the other author, Jonathan Chang, was a little bit more skeptical about this. He was a little bit more negative. And what do you say about that? Uh, there are two types of Confucian view. Yes, closer, closer. Um, closer. I, I, closer. Okay. I think. Both, yeah. both are uh, extremes, they, they are wrong. One type of conclusion is that so there's a lot of imagines, so called Western concept. It's not there in Confucian, Confucian focuses on virtue. You must reject this interest of individual choice based concept of human rights. That's why it's really Another extreme says human rights is the whole new right development of ethics for everyone. Confusion means you must accept a full, broad, liberal, individualist conception of human rights, including a right to do moral and wrong thing. And you may know that some liberal scholars but they argue that an individual has a right to do morally wrong things. Mm -hmm. They have the right to gambling, the right to doing no work, even the right to incest. Well, I think the right Confucian position must be somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So you are saying that Confucianism is not necessarily against human rights? So it, it could be compatible. You want to have yeah. a minimal concept of human rights. A minimal right. okay, concept. That's a historically right. reasonable for Confucian to have okay. a minimal right. history of human rights. If Confucian is, cannot accept that, Confucian is must be problematic. It must be okay. On the other hand, right. if you all Confucian is must accept a full class, a liberal, right. individualist concept uh, of human rights, right. that's another issue. Right. Right. That must be also. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if some I go to Islam because in the book there was a um, very strong position, not by you, but uh, by the other author, um, yeah. Darush, uh, and he was basically saying that he used the word colonialism yeah. as well. What do you th think about that? Um, that you said the type of colonialism going on? Um, closer, closer. So I think that um, the, the notion of rights is terminologically, but also its uh, metaphysical roots are indeed uh, from an enlightenment Western mm -hmm. Christian common, right? So when you talk about rights, you talk about liberty, as in just the example that's given to you. Uh, and I think that uh, Islam and other traditions say that rights have more notion of duties and obligations, mm -hmm. not I am free to do something. I also think that the notion of rights have a metaphysical root, as mm -hmm. Professor Garcia mentioned, uh, in the notion that they adhere within human beings. And uh, it's part of natural law theory in many traditions, Judaism, Islam, and others, 
don't have the same notion of metaphysical roots of natural law that we that you guys share. Right. So I do think that it is a hegemonic uh, discourse that is produced. That's a big word. That's a big uh, word. That is produced from. <laughs> no, 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 yes. That is produced from a strict particular understanding All right. of the human being and society. Right. That is yeah. therefore enforced upon others uh, to have a discourse that we consider to be liberal and civil. Okay. Uh, so, so you do think there is a high, a kind of imposition to, that frames a dialogue. Well, correct. Right. Um, that and Islam might not be totally at ease with or comfortable with. That's it's, yeah. it's a framing. It's a, yeah. it's a framing. The marginalized views. At the same time, just as Ellen said, there might be moral equivalencies. There might be homomorphic equivalents for the notion that the of duties and basic needs and fundamental responsibilities. But those are not right. Those are there. But we still frame the discourse in a certain vernacular, right. right. or that is problematic. Okay. So let's go to um, Christianity and Judaism. That seems to be the origin or the most compatible with um, the sources, the origins of human rights. Um, so, Jonathan, what do you think is the main biblical or or conceptual um, reason why uh, Judaism is quite comfortable with the, the language of rights. Uh, is it because of its historical background or is it more like a religious thing or because of the Holocaust? Is there some kind of reasons why Judaism is very, in general, most Jews I've spoken to are very favorable to uh, the idea of human rights? Well, it's actually both. Although in Judaism, one could claim that uh, individuals have uh, no autonomy mm -hmm. because uh, we don't own our body. Mm -hmm. According to Judaism, uh, our body, and one could extend it to our decisions, are uh, owned by God. Mm -hmm. It's God's uh, way to lead us. Mm -hmm. In Hebrew, we have a Talmudic saying, Everything is dictated by God, mm -hmm. but still human beings have the obligation, mm -hmm. the, the obligation and the right to select their own path, whether to do good mm -hmm. or to do bad mm -hmm. in the eyes but they're free. of There's some freedom. The eyes freedom. God and, the, and there is freedom. Yeah. They will be, uh, their destiny will be dictated by God uh, accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, if you take, for instance, and we said it in the chapter when we and Professor Head, who is a secular Jew and I is a religious Jew, if uh, you read the paper, there is a convergence. For instance, if you take the issue of abortion, mm -hmm. so as uh, the woman does not own her body, uh, she has no right to decide about decision about her own body, which is mm -hmm. against modern principles mm -hmm. of uh, human rights. On the other hand, the principle of sanctity of life, mm -hmm. which is the prime principle of Judaism, mm -hmm. would uh, forbid abortions mm -hmm. like uh, Christianity because of the sanctity of life. Yeah, right. As opposed to one life. It's so, interesting that you mention abortion because um, at the same time, I think um, there are at least in the liberal uh, world a core or at least a promotion to make abortion a human part of human rights, right? And even uh, same-sex marriage is part of the human rights that we, we need to do that. How do you explain this kind of conflict when, when you say that this is wrong and then at the same time others are saying that, okay, we have to expand the rights. I would, I mean, go to you and then maybe Alberto can, can also answer that later. What, what would you, how would you say as to that? Well, again, abortion is allowed and practice in Israel whenever there is even a remote mm -hmm. um, a fear that there will be any damage mm -hmm. from the pregnancy to the right. mother right. and even to the baby. Right. And we are talking about damage, we are not talking only about physical damage mm -hmm. or severe congenital night formation that necessitates mm -hmm. abortion of the body. In the Israeli law, which is based both on religious and secular principles. Right, but I'm talking about the rights as if, as if like, when, when they talk about abortion as a basic human rights, it means that it's universal. Anyone, any woman who wants an abortion, whether it is like the case you mentioned or any other type of 
reasons they give, it should be given to them freely. So, so that's that's a, the other extreme of human rights. Yeah. Yeah. Not to let the right person right. Right. not agree. Right. It's a woman who decides with no reason, okay, no reason, no danger to right. herself or to the baby right. to terminate life. I right. think it's against human nature. Right. So Judaism would be allowed. Of life. We would not accept that type of. Uh, extension of human rights include abortion. Um, By the way, that's once the embryo is in the womb. Right. If you take the issue of inbuilt fertilization, when the embryo is in the test tube, you're allowed to discard it for no reason at all. Right. According to Judaism, even according to the strictest halakhic uh -huh. Jewish law, yes. rulers. So, but once it's in the womb, it has a potential to develop right. a full human being. You are not allowed to destroy it. Without obviously, yes. um, in the in the book, actually, there were um, papers, as she, especially by Palosani and Kwan, that really criticized this broadening of human rights to include a lot of these liberal ideas. Um, maybe I'm not sure. Martha wants to mention something about that, and not that for that is for the translation. Yes, uh, for Catholicism, um, human rights is like something good, although it, it, it began with tension among uh, the, the understanding of freedom in a very relativistic and liberal way, because freedom in the, in, in the human rights declaration is meant to be uh, not um, linked to good and to God. And uh, for then after, I mean, after dialogues and, and, and after time passes, passed by, um, Catholicism opened more, more and, uh, and accepted the declaration by itself, but does not accept that there's still tension in, in some aspects. For example, in the beginning and in the end of life issues, um, as for Catholics, uh, life begins with, with uh, the, the first cell, the yeah. with conception. And because of that, uh, and, and also that life is given by God through a human act, but by God. So, since that moment, we can't um, we we can skip uh, or or think that we are the, the the owners of that life, not not even our own life, no. And so, um, well, but uh, human rights are are like uh, very easy for Catholicism to to be followed in the practical way. The, the matter that counts here is not the practical way, but the theoretical foundation of it. That is the way, that, that is a, the, the thing in which uh, Catholicism does not agree with the foundation. Right. The what, is, what would the Catholics found, how would it found um, human rights? Okay, the, the human rights in, human rights in Catholicism is founded in natural law. Uh, meaning by natural law, the law that uh, the, the human understanding, right. but which is not complete and wide and all that is like God's understanding, uh, but that the good that is inserted in or imprinted in in the in human nature, no, and right. so that is natural law. And as uh, Jonathan was saying. It is, I mean, it's not, not normal that one thinks that it's a right to dispose of another's life for no reason at all. So, so in some way, um, the difference between, I mean, from what I understand is from the Catholic understanding of human rights and the liberal or liberal understanding of human rights is that Catholic understanding of human rights look at human nature as kind of foundation, whereas liberal and saying human rights is less uh, founded on something more substantial more is more yes. like would you agree to that um, professor Garcia 
Uh, and, and, and going back to that question, how do you avoid this broadening of human rights include so many different kinds of rights? Yeah. Yeah, basically agree, I would say, from the Christian and Catholic point of view, but I would like to emphasize that from the, the Catholic vision, it's not only an individualistic or liberal okay. vision, but it's a, what in the social teaching of the church is called an, an, an um, integral and solidary humanism. A solitary, solid, solidary, 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 solidary. 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 That means that we are not only individuals, okay. but we are also part of okay. the society, of the community. Right. And that implies that uh, human rights as fundamental goods mm -hmm. are the only things that I can claim mm -hmm. and to challenge others or to challenge the society. I have the right to freedom. I have the right to so you think you think let me finish. Right. I have the right to whatever. You have the right like when to I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I when I just want to clarify for the audience. You know what I want. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that rights are correlated with duties and responsibilities. And there is no real rights mm -hmm. if there's not a correlative duty. Mm -hmm. That means that when we claim for a right, the right for abortion first, is it fundamental need of humans? Mm -hmm. The audience <laughs> is this. It doesn't mean that in certain situations, the law recognizes the possibility of the state of need in the case, and then sometimes it's not punished abortion. Mm -hmm. But one thing is to say that life is good and freedom is good, fundamental good. And another thing is to say abortion is a fundamental good that we should recognize. And that means that the more abortion there are, the better it is. This is, you're talking from an interesting position. Yeah, um, but I think it's it's a only Catholic. I, mean, I think this is the general human rights. I, I would I like to, 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 to talk, as we are trying to do here, not only for Catholics. Right. And then if, if I say that the more freedom, the more true they are in the society, the better it is. I see Ruping smiling and also yeah, smiling. And talk. <laughs> smile and talk. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you want to say something? Because uh, the, the yeah. listeners are a little bit more skeptical. I'd like to point out that uh, uh, Buddhism as a religion, uh, in a sense, really not uh, <clears throat> very skeptical about uh, a kind of like a, a more um, committed to any moral principle that makes it very dogmatic. So um, it follows that in terms of what human rights, they, they would have trouble to see it as a kind of ideology which has to be committed absolutely at any occasion without giving consideration of the situation. For example, um, they would say that in society, when uh, human rights uh, become inflated, like everything becomes rights, and, and which is particularly based on the notion of this absolute individualism, and they would really um, I think they will criticize that kind of situation. But in another situation, um, for example, like the, uh, when human life is in danger, um, like ethnic cleansing or some other thing, I think people really would be sided with the human rights because they think that human rights at this moment can be used as a protective mechanism and to, uh, to safeguard um, the life. So for the, so what I want to say is that for Buddhism, it's very hard to say if Buddhism agree or not agree. I have mm -hmm. to say depending on the situation. Right. It seems like, um, at least from what we've come up, spoken so far, is a question about the foundation of human rights and how we understand that foundation. I get to you, no, don't worry. Um, and whether it is based on something of the human good, of human nature, or is it more the emphasis on Freedom, right, which is unlinked from any uh, essence or any truth or that, any human nature. Um, I want to move to another uh, topic since uh, Helen was talking about Buddhism. I wonder, um, a lot of people here um, understand, or at least um, there is a current um, debate about animal rights. And 
um, I'm not sure, I think I, in your paper you mentioned that according to Buddhism, um, humans are not that much superior to animals in, in certain ways, right? So um, would you agree that Buddhism, they might accept certain kinds of animal rights? And if that's the case, um, how could human rights be applied only to humans? Or is there is there an extension even to all life? How would you what do you say to that? Okay, um, in the past practice, I think among Buddhist scholars, there's, there's an ongoing debate about um, whether Buddhism is a kind of what we would term non anthropocentric religion uh, compared with the other maybe religion. Um, as I said earlier, that uh, the language of rights is foreign actually to Buddhism, whether it is human rights or animal rights. But then of course now people have you know Buddhism, you know have have to be engaged in this conversation to talk about human rights. So some Buddhists go say, well well we need to talk about also animal rights along with the human rights. So which give a suggestion that you know humans should be uh, an animal to be treated equally. Uh -huh. and so it's not anthropocentric. Uh, but my personal view right. is that actually I do not agree with that. I think it's kind of uh, really depending on how you read Buddhism. I mean, if you read literature, you can argue for so called non you know, non anthropocentric one. But on the other hand, you can read the stories. Uh, a special uh, status, yeah. Yeah, but like they, they believe in reincarnation. And, and also, like, you know what they want to be reincarnated as an animal. I mean, it's a it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so they also want to be as humans. And uh, so, so in that case, so I, I, that's why I argue right. that you, in the sense that we, we can reconstruct whole thing, look at the whole thing, right. and, we, and there's still a notion of, of, of why it can be applied to okay. human beings, not applied to animals. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to move to Hinduism, which is the, uh, basically, um, you could say, the yeah, precursor of, um, of Buddhism. Um, no, actually, speak to the other mic. That mic is just leave it there, yeah. yeah. Facing you, facing you, yeah. The other mic facing you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, right. Um, so, in, in some way, um, it, it's not as broad as Buddhism to include all animals, but in uh, Hinduism, we know that there's the, the caste system, and the, uh, as I understand it, in the caste system, uh, that is quite ingrained in Hinduism. Uh, all human beings are not created equal, if that's my interpretation correctly. That there are actually a hierarchy you know, of importance. So we are in that in this situation. How do we talk about human rights? Because if we are not equal, fundamentally equal, um, then we don't have the same rights. Well, first I want to clarify: is is this thing wrong? Yeah, okay. yes. I want to clarify exactly what we're talking about. The, the discourse of human rights really doesn't become active uh, in, the, in the international political order until the 1970s, and it's associated with the with the passage of two positive legal documents: the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights and another International Covenant. And so, human rights is a is, is a when you say human rights, you're referring to a very specific, very discourse that's related specifically to positive legal documents that are in the international sphere. Mm -hmm. What year were we talking about? 1970s? Yeah. I mean, Samuel Moyne. I mean, there's but, I mean, the, the, the Universal Declaration was 1948. But, the, but the, the, the widespread discourse about human rights really doesn't okay. begin until later. And if you, you can do literature, I've done literature searches searching on the phrase human rights, it doesn't really get start to get active until the 70s. In any event, you can say even if it's active after World War II, after 1948 with the, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay. It's a very new discourse. What you're conflating the discourse about natural rights with human rights. And so natural rights is the language that was started in the probably 12th or 13th century in various church documents, which begin to recognize certain political rights, certainly recognize the right to self-defense, for instance, as a kind of fundamental right. 
Now, in, in the discourse, if we're talking about Hinduism, uh, for instance, now, no, I'm going to put aside the whole thing about human rights because it's irrelevant in a sense, except to the extent it's institutionalized in the Indian Constitution, That's right? Because right? yes. it's a legal thing. But natural rights, now we're talking about human nature and, and, and so on. And so in, in Hinduism, it does, in the same way that, for instance, Aristotle does, recognize that there are different kinds of people. And, and it char characterizes them in four different ways. And it says, you know, that it, it recognizes. So in Hinduism, there's two things. One is the. But you theory. use the rights language applied to Hinduism. Well, if, I, if I'm going to use it, I, I can use it. Right. I'm under translating the concept of dogma, I can use it. I, I don't really, I don't think it's problematic. Uh -huh. But it's uh, natural rights I'm talking about, and not human rights. Right. Okay. So natural right is is something a characteristic of the human being that requires action or inaction on the part of another. It's an it's an entitlement. That's a social or socio-political or socio-economic entitlement so, that resides. Right. According to so the caste system, you're yeah. saying that they would have different natural rights. Correct. Okay. Uh, they would be so they have different dharma. They have a different, in a sense, a different. Um, because, like, in, for in example, some, it, it, in a certain way, you're saying that, for example, in touchable, and uh, which is the lowest caste uh, in Hinduism, they, they don't have any rights. A lot of things, right? Uh, are those natural rights that they don't have, or is it just more like a imposed societal condition that I want to distinguish carefully that between the theory of, yeah. of this, so the, the philosophical background right. of recognizing the difference between different kinds of people, and the actuality that has been inherited after you know seven, you know, centuries of in that the caste system in India, as a practical matter, is a complete disaster. As a, as a matter of rights of any kind, any kind of rights discourse, natural rights or human rights discourse, it's a mess because it results in human suffering. Right. It's not intended to be a classification system that results in human suffering. It's more a classification system that's supposed to say, well, recognize that people are of different kinds, and some people, you know, there's going to be a lawyer sitting in his office, and he's going to have a secretary, you know, which is something I recognize, right. you know, or there's going to be the boss, right? And there's going to be other I, people. It's just for me, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, for me. How do you, um, how, how does the Indian Constitution acknowledge equality of all people, and at the same time, the religion itself is? Has this in, in built uh, understanding of difference, and so I mean, it's just it's number one history. is that it's not. Yeah. If you if you you're going to misunderstand the context if you consider it a religion, because also central to the Hindu or whatever is Indian tradition is compassion. I mean, we'll find it perhaps articulated more carefully in the Buddhist side, but the the, the basic. Spiritual, spiritual teaching is to love the other and to have compassion towards the other. And so, and including animals and including all living things, you know, to some extent this manifests most strongly in the Jain tradition, but in the so-called Hindu tradition, compassion is the, is the primary concern. And they, so this classification system is not intended to impose suffering or to, or to restrict people's Access to basic originally, religion. originally. Well, it, that that's right. I mean, in practice, it's a it's a mess. And right. In practice, in the Indian Constitution, it's outlawed, and the Indian government tries very, you know, spent a lot of efforts to to ameliorate the caste system and to remove the caste system from society. But the the theory of the caste system is not. Uh, you know, it's really not foreign to our to our common experience. We recognize among different. You know, we know. I, I suspect we all know. Those are social differences, but I guess we, we here we're talking about fundamental differences. I mean, I think I think uh, I would use the word in Hindu. It seems like the differences is almost metaphysical or ontological, whereas 
in the West, you will see that those differences are more accidental. Um, that they are differences because we are. Well, and, and that, that's not, that would not necessarily be a foreign discussion. Right. I mean, you're not, you haven't asked me about the causes of it. Right. You just, you know, so this is, this is, you, you're saying, does, does Hinduism recognize that there are different kinds of people? The answer is yes. The, the question as to why does it do that and what are the implications of that and what is the theory of the person that lies behind it? Because it, the, whatever Hinduism is, there are many, or a few very, very sophisticated theories of the person in, in the Indian tradition in which people are all the same, right? But, but whether they, whether, when they manifest okay. in different dharmas, it, dharma being a word that sort of has something to do with social order and law, they can manifest in different ways. But people, the, 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 the structure of all human beings is the same. Okay. All right, let's move to Islam. Um, <coughs> not much time. Um, um, in Islam, in, at least in the, um, the writings, um, there seems to be a tension between um, divine rights and human rights, or rights of God versus human rights. Um, do you think there is, is true that there is this tension, at least uh, from the other author, uh, that wrote the chapter, he would say that um, we don't need human rights because really um, God's rights trumps all human rights. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I think, I think it might be uh, maybe a mis, mis uh, understanding in the way we probably go. But, but the, point, the point is that, that, um, that what we would consider rights, uh, what would be the tradition rights would be things that are owed to someone, right? So God's rights are things that are owed to God by humanity. Uh, human rights would be things that are owed to humanity by other humans, right? So, so that would be the heuristic that there's God's rights, things that God, that humanity owes God, like recognizing God, and but humanity owes other human beings, like you know, I should be able to purchase something from you. So they're uh, they're called hukuk or haq Allah, haq haq and said, and there are things in between that are shared. Um, you know, there's a portion of it which is like uh, that's that's part of it's for God, part of it's for for uh, for human beings. So you think about that in terms of charity, mm -hmm. right? So for as Muslims, uh, zakat giving is part of our five pillars, right, which we call charity in English. Um, but that's rights of God, but within it are rights of man, right? Because you're giving it to individuals. Um, so I think that's that's the your so there's an intention. I'm not sure why he says intention, but what he's trying to communicate, I believe, is that that we don't need human rights theory discourse here because for us, it's a textual and scriptural tradition. What is owed to other human beings is within the text, okay. it's from the text, right? right? So God's revelation gives us a sense of what are those human rights, what okay. are the things that are responsibilities that. Oh. Uh, versus right uh, something coming from just a, a, a biological origin that we share humanity. And even those fundamental necessities are coming to us from revelatory guidance right. and the prophetic example. Uh, and so that's that's why he's sort of saying, well, we don't need someone else to tell something else, another discourse, our metaphysical, ontological, epistemological right. reality of how rights come about are through the scriptural text. Okay, he mentioned in, in the text uh, a certain Islamic declaration of human rights that are Diverse or different from the universal declaration. Yeah. Um, is is that based on Quran and also the prophetic? So, so those 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 declarations, and I mentioned them as well in, in my writings, um, to bring out this the first point I was making: this distinction between what we commonly think about about the universal declarations and Muslim nations sort of sign on to that, but then you had Islamic version, and the replacement was that we would the origin of those duties and obligations are from the Sharia. Islamic law. Mm -hmm. That was the replacement. Meaning, we do not acknowledge that human intellect can give us moral norms without the guidance mm -hmm. of revelation. So mm -hmm. that's what they're saying. So if you're going to start saying we are bound and obligated to do certain things, we must make sure that those are derived from the basis of the Quran and the Sunnah and other sort of Islamic mm -hmm. tools and instruments, mm -hmm. not from an external imposition. Mm -hmm. That, this is why I said it's a sort of discourse that's being marginalized right. and confused. Right. And so you're trying to address that by saying, well, we want to restore that, to claim for ourselves 
a religiously, scripturally based understanding of what we are going to, uh, what are the rights of society upon us, whatever else it might be. Mm-hmm. That was, that's, that's the reason those declarations exist. That you can talk to whatever political authority you want, right? They're not Islamic necessarily, uh, but if you're going to talk to Muslim tradition, Islamic tradition, then we must put a place for the Sharia within it. It's kind of similar to the Judeo-Jewish understanding of human rights as well, or is it quite different? How would you, how would you say that is different from the Islamic interpretation? The tension between our tension, the, the difference between God's rights and human rights. How would, how is the Jewish way of seeing human rights different from the Islamic way of seeing uh, human rights? Well, as I said before, in Judaism, God gave human beings a free choice. Okay. And, uh, and they are free to choose between, uh, you know, there is a verse in the Torah that you should choose life. Uh-huh. Right? Prefer the good over evil. So I think there is free choice in Judaism. Right. Whereas in Islam there's no free choice, I think there's, there's free choice too. Yeah. But if your free choice has to be um, within no, no, there's a yeah. no, no, What I'm saying to you is that when you want to get a moral norm, uh-huh. right, that you think has a binding uh, obligation upon individuals, right. you must source that to some extent or construct a sourcing for that right. within revelatory guidance. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you don't call it Islamic, call it whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it. Uh, it's a very textual, heavy tradition, both Sunni and Shia. But yes, there is a epistemic authority, right? Interpreting the verses requires intellect, right? Rationally. I mean, right? You have to use the intellect, but it's subservient to the textual tradition and the orally transmitted tradition. That's that's the point. So yes, we are free to choose. Otherwise, we would have nothing else. Right? Well, there's no point of religion then. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you another touchy question. You don't have to answer if you think it's a little too touchy. Um, in the West, there seems to be an impression um, that in Islam, women's women have a less, I don't know, less rights, uh, I would say, uh, than men. Mm. Or is that something that is more like a perception, or is it based on Quran or Revelation? I mean, just, just this is I'm not really I don't know really. Uh, yes, so true that is. I, I, so I, th- I think it's interesting. Uh, where we map on uh, paternalistic societies and then say, oh, so you look at the Muslim and you say that's Islamic. You conflate Muslim mm-hmm. practices, cultural mm-hmm. rights, and you say Islamic. Uh, I think the sociological. But you would distinguish Muslim from, from Islamic. Islamic. Okay. Right? Well, Muslim would be the culture, and or, then or Islamic would be the religion. I mean, any religion okay. has lived experience, right? right. There are customs to different societies. Within that, so, 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 so that's, that's one piece. But I would say that, yes, there are differences between the rights and obligations that men and women have. And actually, if you look at the scriptural tradition, the prophet talking about human rights, right? And, uh, things owed, duties owed to others. A man comes to the prophet and says, you know, who should I honor most? He says, your mother. He says, who? Your mother. Who? Your mother. Who next? Maybe your father. Your father, right? <laughs> Meaning that 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 that, that person, had, right? Whose foot is paradise and Eve? The mother. So the the sense of that your responsibility is to caretake and and give things to your wife or your mother is much more than the father, right? Uh, or the husband. Um, so there, but it becomes in different spheres of life, right? So then you say, well, there's a verse in the Quran that says men, you know, get twice the inheritance of women, right? Because they have a caretaking responsibility. So you have to understand the context of what, not the context, the context of what the scriptural source are talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just brandishing, okay, Islam says women are less than men, I think is a gross mischaracterization of any tradition uh, and any culture, even. Yeah. Good. I mean, it's, that's also another complaint about Confucianism or well, the same thing. Would you say, the, say that is um, similar? Um, yeah, I guess uh, I, I would say similar thing that those that thing just said, you know, we have to distinguish history, sociology, culture, on one hand, and the ethical teaching, the doctrine of the religion, on the other hand, if you look at Chinese history, for example, and some Chinese start custom in history, yeah, I think uh, if we didn't treat women well in some 
kind of the ladies. Mm. Of course, we also have a lot of positive ways that we can in our mother and wives, and the people are talking about Chinese wives are so powerful, Chinese <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but I don't also deny that in some countries, in the belt, and, uh, and so on. And we didn't live in the belt. But if you let look at the Confucian classical teachings, Okay. Now that um, you have the floor and also Alan, um, we know that um, both of you came from China originally, um, and China, at least according to West, is an impression that, and also a lot of people saying that uh, it's very sensitive. To human rights, as if this is like they're afraid of human rights, or they, they they're not very open to human rights. Uh, remember, when in Hong Kong, it's like very sensitive issue. When you talk about human rights, it becomes political. When in fact, it's not really a political concept. It is a political concept. It's not not a threat, right? So um, I'm wondering, is this somehow related to the religion or religion? Of the Chinese people, which is Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, or is this something more um, with a different cause? It, 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 does Confucianism and Buddhism have a contribution to this misunderstanding of this fear or this whatever you call it uh, resistance to human rights? Ripping and Ellen. My perspective, I think when Chinese government criticizes human rights, and the US, you know, Chinese is looking at so called universal value, I think it is more like because this um, is the current political system. So for me, it's more like a political claim rather than the influence of the tradition. Okay. And of course, then you can also, and sometimes people also try to influence the government. Um, this kind of anti human rights uh, gesture mm -hmm. by saying, well, you know, like something totally from the West, and it doesn't fit into Chinese culture, but you know, I think it's purely rhetorical. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as I said, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, objectively, yeah, it's true that there's a kind of a gap of between Chinese tradition and uh, the Western so called enlightenment, so called enlightenment, so called human rights. But in terms of the government, I think they have, they have their own reason mm -hmm. and not accept the rights. So that's my own observation. Breaking? Uh, well, I guess this sounds like a political question, but I don't understand politics much. <laughs> I guess the reality is, we talk about China. Uh, there are several quite different conceptions of human rights. A Confucian conception of human rights. I have always been promoting and mentalizing China to accept the Confucian conception of human rights. And we also have, you know, the other scholars talking about Buddhist conception of human rights, Taoist conception of human rights, and Christian conception of human rights, liberal conception of human rights, and the rights. And also, I'm not sure if I understand the Alan's being correct, but I think Chinese government also has a official kind of view of human rights. And what and, uh, uh, I don't know. I think that's a social concept. A socialist, right? okay. So something like that. I think what, what's that exactly? I'm no expert on that. Okay. I never studied it. I think that's the, that's the case. We have so move on to it's a um, very right, pluralistic situation. Because, uh, a lot of people. Right, we have to move on to uh, yeah. consent, which is the second they, part of this. Uh, the consent. They, 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 they are good governments, they are human rights governments, international uh, ICC, they are international covenants of political rights, and the international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. The latter covenant is socialist in nature, and, and the Chinese government. Can recognize those rights because they're community rights, they're social rights, they're not individual rights. It's the first covenant which is problematic for the, for the Chinese government, not a socialist government, because they're individual rights, they're liberal rights, not social rights. Okay. 
um, the, um, part of the, this uh, book report is also related to what we've been doing in the last uh, couple of days here in Rome. Uh, we also started to do another uh, discussion on a more bioethical issue, which is uh, informed consent and human rights from a religious perspective. So um, we would like to move on to the next part of this uh, 